Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about the philosophical thought experiment, Bob's Bugatti. Let's go ahead and get started. So Bob's Bugatti is an example of applied utilitarianism. So Peter Singer is a contemporary utilitarian, and he uses this thought experiment to explore his views on world poverty and what we should do about it. So let's take a look at it. So we see here a, well, comic version of the thought experiment. We should note that the, it originally was created by Peter Unger in the book Living High and Letting Die, but Peter Singer popularizes it in the work The Singer Solution to World Poverty. Essentially, the thought experiment is that a train, or a trolley, is heading towards a small child and will kill it unless it's diverted. However, Bob has the option to divert the train. If he does, it hits his Bugatti, destroying it. Now, for whatever reason, the Bugatti isn't insured. And if you know anything about Bugattis, they usually run over $2 million. So he's in this terrible position. He has to choose between his pride and joy and also describes his also life savings are all invested into this Bugatti and that of a child's life. As the scenario goes, Bob, it turns out, decides not to throw the switch. The child is killed. As Singer puts it, for many years to come, Bob enjoys owning his Bugatti and the financial security it represents. The question is, did Bob do the right thing? So take a moment and perhaps pause the video and think about this. Did Bob make the right decision? Now, if you're like most individuals, the answer is an overwhelming no. It's almost unanimous that people view Bob as doing the wrong action here. He valued his car over a person's life, a child's life at that. Sure, a very expensive car, but a car nonetheless. So how do we apply this to world poverty? Well, Peter Singer notes that we are actually all in Bob's situation that it turns out that we also have the ability to sacrifice our luxury items to save children's lives and adults' lives. In the reading, he talks about how it takes as little as $200 to save a child's life in extreme poverty. So every time we choose to spend money on luxuries instead of donating them to effective charities, charities that actually do save people's lives, we are letting people die or suffer from hunger or curable diseases that we could have prevented otherwise. There are organizations out there that the more money that they are given, the more lives that are saved, the more lives that are transformed. So the central claim here that Peter Singer is making with this article is that you should give away almost all money to effective charities that you would normally spend on luxuries, that you'd normally spend on things that you don't need. Now, not many people own Bugattis, but almost everybody who's reading this article, at least, so he's writing this to the audience of first world countries, it was written for the New York Times, almost everyone who is reading this article has something that they spend money on that they don't need. And if they save that money, maybe over time, or perhaps just a single expense, could literally save people's lives if donated to the right charities, to effective charities. So for the same reason that Bob should sacrifice his Bugatti, you, individually, should save lives of others by sacrificing your extra money. We want to be clear here that Peter Singer's making a moral argument, not a political one. He's saying, what should you do with your money, with your extra income? How should you spend your money? Now, sure, you should survive and be happy, but he claims that, look, you can actually be very happy off of very little, and you can be spending money on a lot of other things that would be saving people's lives rather than, well, upgrading your life, you could say, in small ways. This is Singer's core argument, the argument that's behind the Bob's Bugatti thought experiment. So premise one, 
if we're able to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of comparable moral significance, we ought to do it. Premise 2. It takes very little money to save or dramatically improve the lives of those in extreme poverty. The conclusion, we ought to donate our extra money to save or otherwise dramatically improve the lives of those in extreme poverty. So the conclusion seems to follow from the premises, so if you want to critique this argument, you need to assess the premises. So premise one, you know, if we're able to prevent something bad from happening without sacrificing anything of, more, of comparable moral significance, we ought to do it. Well, this seems to be the principle that we use to justify our disgust at Bob, or Bob not sacrificing his car to save the child's life. Well, why? Because the car is ultimately not morally significant, the child's life is. Now, what about print, uh, the second premise, that it takes very little money to save or dramatically improve the lives of those in extreme poverty? Now, that might not have always been the case because it was difficult to fund charities on the other side of the world, and hopefully it won't always be the case, but it is true today, the world that we currently live in, that it does take very little money, comparatively speaking, to literally save people's lives or cure them from diseases or prevent them from malnourishment. It's the world that we live in that we can easily send our money to organizations that will do a tremendous amount of good that they couldn't have done otherwise. And they'll do more good with an extra $200, extra $1,000, so on and so forth than they would do otherwise, or would be able to do otherwise. So it seems like the conclusion follows. If you're like most individuals who come across this argument, you have a flurry of objections going through your mind right now. And one of the most common ones is that he's just demanding way too much of us. Does that really mean that we should be living essentially just slightly above the poverty line ourselves, and giving the rest of our money to individuals or organizations that they will then save individuals that we don't know? Well, from a utilitarian standpoint, that doesn't matter, right? Everybody counts equally and do the action that benefits the world the most overall. And it seems like the world that we currently live in, the best thing we can do with our money is not spend it on luxuries, but instead spend it on saving people's lives or curing them from blindness or preventing them from getting parasites and so on. Now, the way that he responds to this general argument of that he's just demanding way too much, he says, this is the standard for what's right, but he acknowledges that most individuals won't be able to do that overnight. He says something is better than nothing. So start with giving any amount and work on giving more throughout your life. In fact, recently he published or republished a, a, a newer edition of a book called The Life You Can Save. At the very end of that book, he actually recommends a very modest amount. He says, you know what? For most individuals who make under uh, $80,000 a year, just try giving 1% to effective charities, not just any charities, charities that save people's lives. Just giving 1% is far more than most individuals. Most individuals, sure, give some amount of money to charity, but not to effective charities. The money that they give to charity doesn't actually save anybody's lives. Maybe makes a small amount of difference, but not this huge amount of difference, such as curing some of blindness or terrible diseases, preventing their death. So if you just give 1% to effective charities, you're doing far more than most individuals. So start there, this modest level perhaps, and work on increasing that over time. So this isn't all or nothing. Any amount is better than nothing. Saving some lives is better than saving no lives. So I want to uh, talk about a couple questions here. So if we were doing this in the classroom, I normally would have you guys brainstorm in your groups thinking about what are examples of luxury items that the average person spends money on? What are the types of luxuries that you spend money on? Now, if, if you look at the necessities of life, you know, food, we need clothing, shelter, and, and so on. Sure, we spend money on those things, but we usually spend a lot more on those things than we actually need to do. We don't need to go out to eat. We don't need uh, name brand clothes. 
we don't need, sure, we need transportation, but we probably don't need the type of transportation that we get. We don't need the size of house that we live in or apartment we live in or the location. We could go to somewhere else that's a lot cheaper. There's many ways that we live and we spend money on, on things that aren't necessities or we out, perhaps upgrade those things. Not to mention other things like video games or movies, uh, just inter general entertainment. Once again, maybe you can argue that some entertainment is necessary, but that doesn't mean that all the entertainment that we have and the amount of money we spend on entertainment is necessary. What are examples of luxury items the average person spends money on? It turns out it's a lot. Now, how much do you think the average family spends on luxuries per year? We could just do this crude estimate and, and de determining that. So how much do you think the average family spends on luxuries a year? Well, we could look at the average family size in the United States so in 2000. In 18, it was 2.5. Hopefully nobody has 0.5 children, right? But it's just an average. So let's say we round that up to three individuals. Poverty line in 2018 is around 21,000. The average household income in 2018 is around 62,000. Now, if we use that poverty line for what it's supposed to say, now there's debate whether that's actually accurate, right? Whether 20,000 or 21,000 for a family of three is enough uh, to, uh, to live off of. And, and of course, depending on where you live, that's going to be different. But if we just use this as a crude estimate, we can come up with the average individual family has over $40,000 they spend on various ways that they upgrade their life or maybe a bigger house or maybe uh, buying a certain uh, number of cars and so on. Even if this estimate is far off, that's still thousands of dollars seems very plausible that we spend every single year on luxury items. So something I want you to do is take a look at Peter Singer's website for the life you can save. On there, he has this impact calculator. Come up with some estimates of how much you think you spend on luxuries per year or your family and plug them in there. See, look at some of the charities that, you, that money could be going to. What good in the world could it be producing? Now, from Peter Singer's standpoint, as a utilitarian, he's going to say that what you should do, your actions should produce the most overall good in the world. And that includes the way that you spend your money. I think for most individuals, if you look at this charity impact calculator, you will, it, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that at least in some ways that you spend your money, it could be better spent in the terms of doing more good in the world by going to at least one of these charities instead. So as we can see, Peter Singer gives a powerful argument for why we should be giving a significant amount of money to effective charities, charities that save people's lives. If you're like most individuals, you probably have a ton of objections to this because if it's true, that means each of us individually need to make radical changes to, to the way we live our lives. So I look forward to reading your responses, objections, and perhaps defenses to Peter Singer's views on poverty 